This lecture starts with the ominous picture of Hannibal looming over Lake Trasimeno, the site of one of his greatest victories over the Romans. And this is because alongside the Gallic sack of Rome in 390 BC or 386 BC, depending on the dating, uh, Hannibal looms as the other great figure whose legacy terrified Romans for centuries. Uh, the story of Hannibal, though, is a story that actually comes out of Rome's great successes, and especially Rome's great successes in the aftermath of the invasion of Pyrrhus. The invasion of Pyrrhus, uh, which came because of Rome's conflict with Tarentum, was a great test of Roman military strength, but also Roman resilience and Roman willingness to endure costs uh, and casualties in the face of conflict with larger world powers. And it was a test that Rome came through victorious, not because Rome managed to defeat Pyrrhus. He fought three battles with Rome, and although Rome won the third battle, the first two battles were victories for Pyrrhus. But what it showed was that Rome could defeat an adversary even if it didn't win every single battle. And this showed something very important about the Roman basis of power. Their technique of continually building this commonwealth of states in Italy made up of allies and also cities and principalities that were conquered by Rome or defeated by Rome and given Roman citizenship, gave Romans a military capacity that was very different from what we see in the rest of the Mediterranean. And the larger armies that this produced made it possible for Rome to quickly absorb manpower losses and form new armies in ways that other, other powers couldn't. And this was made especially clear by the victories over Pyrrhus, where Pyrrhus had a first world, really well-trained professional army that could defeat the citizen levies put out by Rome and their allies in a pitched battle, but they couldn't match the ability of the Romans to replenish their forces. And the Roman citizen soldiers uh, and the citizen soldiers of Rome's allies fought effectively enough that they could inflict serious losses that Pyrrhus could not replace, while Rome could replenish its manpower quite easily. And so by the 270s, Rome was clearly a major regional power. Uh, but to understand the nature of this region, this lecture and then the next lecture is going to look at how Rome interacted with the other major powers around the Mediterranean. So if we look at this map of the Mediterranean basin that we've seen before, what we see is uh, the, the sort of expanse, the cultural expanse that preceded the emergence of Rome as a, a dominant power in, central, in the central Mediterranean, uh, the, two principal, the two principal entities that expanded across the Mediterranean were Greek and Phoenician city-states. And so to the north and, um, and in Libya, we see Greek city-states establishing colonies along the coastal areas of southern Italy, southern France, parts of Spain, the Black Sea region, uh, and some of the coast of Libya. The other great colonization project was undertaken by Phoenician city-states. Um, these are city-states in what's now Lebanon um, and Israel and Palestine. Uh, and these are cities like the cities of Sidon and Tyre. And you can see the yellow on this map represents Phoenician colonies. And the most prominent of the Phoenician colonies is the city of Carthage. Now Carthage, uh, tradition says, was founded from the city of Tyre in 814 BC. But there's no real evidence of, of significant settlement on the site before about 750 BC. Now, Phoenician colonies are different from Greek colonies because they usually begin as trading settlements that are in effect rented by the settlers, um, and the natives then are given compensation for the use of their land. Greece did not do this. Um, when Greek colonies settled, they took the land. Um, they conquered it and they set up a Greek colony in that space. Uh, Carthage is a little bit different because Carthage starts as this trading settlement, but eventually what we see is that Carthage grew so large that it um, became a kind of integrated space, and then it began expanding out and founding its own colonies and also founding its own, in a sense, political empire. Uh, and this is because Carthage was founded on a particularly advantageous site. So what you see here is the remains of the Carthaginian harbor. Uh, right now, Carthage is a suburb of modern Tunis in Tunisia. In the center of this, we see the uh, famous, the Carthaginian harbor was a famous circular harbor with this island in the center. Uh, and so you can see some of the remains of this right now. The advantage of that circular harbor, of course, is you can put a lot of ships in it, but you can also close it off and defend it quite easily from naval attack. 
But this is a particularly advantageous site, not just because of the harbor area, but also because Carthage is on a beautiful location. Um, these are the remains of the ancient city of Carthage. Um, but the beautiful location is also quite strategically situated. Uh, so when we think about the Mediterranean, we think about trade across the Mediterranean, what we have to understand is there's a difference between the Western and Eastern Mediterranean. And we've already seen this in our discussion of Italian emergence uh, occurring so much later um, in a sort of urban and civilized context than what we see in the Eastern Mediterranean, where Greek cities and especially Egyptian and Fertile Crescent cities begin far, far earlier than anything in the Western Mediterranean. And so this creates a dynamic in which the Western Mediterranean, and especially places like Spain, um, provide raw materials that are used by the more developed and sophisticated urban environments and city-states in the Eastern Mediterranean. And so what we have to imagine is that the trade going from West to East involves raw materials largely coming from the West and finished goods of higher value going from the East in exchange. Carthage occupies the midpoint of this. Um, Carthage, because it controls an, a relatively narrow strait between North Africa and the island of Sicily, uh, Carthage can control the movement of raw materials from the west to the urban environments of the east and the finished products from the east going back to the west. Um, now, Carthage has very little incentive to restrict that trade, but Carthage also has significant incentives to dominate that trade. And so the location of Carthage, uh, a place with a great harbor on a really beautiful location in the center of the Mediterranean that gives it the strategic ability to regulate trade across the Mediterranean, makes it natural that Carthage will be an important place. Uh, and uh, it also makes it natural that Carthage will look to expand militarily in areas that allow it to control the access points for east-west trade. Uh, and so Carthage, of course, develops in North Africa, but it also uh, becomes interested in dominating eastern Sicily, the other side of that strait, uh, and Sardinia, the island um, you know, just to the northwest of Sicily that also controls part of that trans-Mediterranean trade. Now, the other thing that we see about Carthage that I think is perhaps surprising to us is that the area of North Africa where Carthage is located is actually a very fertile area in antiquity. So not only is Carthage well situated to, to regulate trade, but Carthage is also a place that has extremely good farmland. And this is somewhat surprising to us because oftentimes when we think of North Africa, we immediately think of the Sahara Desert. And this is, of course, true. The Sahara Desert is in North Africa. But when we're thinking about ancient Carthage, there's a couple of things we have to keep in mind. Uh, first, the coastal plain along the coast of what's now Tunisia is and remains very fertile land. But in antiquity, it was even more fertile. And there are a couple of reasons for this. The first is that the Sahara has actually expanded significantly since antiquity. So the fertile land in North Africa extended deeper into the interior of the continent in antiquity than it did now. And we can see some remains of this even if we're thinking about the fauna that is tramping around in North Africa in antiquity. So now, of course, when we think of African, large African animals, we think of them as sub-Saharan African animals. Um, when we think of lions or we think of elephants, they live below the Sahara. They don't live above the Sahara. In antiquity, they lived above the Sahara as well. There's a species of African elephants that the Carthaginians actually are able to domesticate, but they also have a ready supply of them because they are native to the North African coastal areas where Carthage is situated. Also, and it's surprising to us to imagine this, there were North African lions. Um, the last wild lion in the region was actually killed in Algeria in 1958. And so in living memory, there were lions in North Africa. Um, these are populations that, of course, could move across Africa when the Sahara was more grassland than it was a uh, big sandy desert. And those populations then get separated at a certain point because of ecological conditions changing. But during antiquity, those populations of large African mammals are still in North Africa because the 
terrain and the topography and the precipitation um, is still closely enough resembling sub-Saharan Africa that they can continue to live. Now, culturally, what we have to understand is the city of Carthage is a, a culturally mixed environment made up of the descendants of Phoenician colonists and a native or Berber element uh, that was native to the region before the Phoenicians showed up. But the language, generally speaking, for the highest class people and the urban people is a language that's called Neo-Punic, which is a, de a descendant and a sort of linguistic descendant of the Semitic language spoken by Phoenicians. And the city uh, quickly becomes a major power because of all of these advantages. So the Greek colonists um, contest with Carthage in Sicily to some degree, but they don't have any interest in or any ability to go into North Africa in the places where Carthage uh, exercises control because, part, because Carthage is simply too strong for them to challenge. The other thing that we see is, of course, this uh, interaction that we have between Carthage and Rome, an interaction that starts basically at the same time that the Roman Republic starts. Um, and this is a treaty we've talked about in the past, where uh, basically the treaty holds out that men landing for trade shall conclude no business save in the presence of a herald or a town clerk. Uh, and if any Roman comes to the Carthaginian province in Sicily, he shall enjoy the rights of all, all the rights of Romans. Now, when we talked about this treaty before, we talked about it in the context of Roman developments. And in particular, the treaty lending recognition both to the government structure of the Republic and also the claims that the Republic had over territories in Italy that in fact the Republic didn't really control. On the Carthaginian side, what this represents is a, one of a series of treaties that Carthaginians conduct and conclude with regional powers that are designed to establish a recognition among Italian states for a Carthaginian sphere of influence in Sicily. Uh, and this reflects a process by which the Carthaginians are expanding their control and expanding their authority out from their North African core to, again, dominate these areas that also affect the northern side of those access points that enable trade across the Mediterranean. Uh, now, in the 5th century, Carthage unfortunately loses a significant amount of the territory that it once had in Sicily because the Greek city-states in the east of the island retook much of this territory. But in response, Carthage begins building a power base in North Africa um, that can counteract some of the expansion of Carthaginian control in Sicily. But Carthage also makes sure to maintain its presence in western Sicily at that place, that kind of choke point in the Mediterranean between Carthage in North Africa and Sicily. Um, and this makes a lot of sense because it enables Carthage to again dominate the maritime trade from east to west. Now, uh, the interesting thing about these struggles in Sicily um, and in Italy is that Rome and Carthage actually are allies for a lot of these struggles. Um, Rome actually supports Carthage in its struggles in Sicily, and Rome is actually a reliable ally of Carthage. But even more surprising is Carthage's support for Rome. Um, when Pyrrhus was fighting the Romans in 280 BC, a Carthaginian fleet actually comes to reinforce the Romans and prevent reinforcements from landing uh, in Italy to help Pyrrhus out. And this is because both Romans and Carthaginians had a natural suspicion of Greek forces, particularly Greek forces coming from the Greek mainland, moving into the West. Um, and, and this is especially true in the aftermath of Alexander the Great's conquests in the later part of the 4th century BC. Both Rome and Carthage saw their central Mediterranean spheres of influence as places that uh, collectively the two of them wanted to preserve from Greek meddling. Um, and especially mainland Greek meddling by people like Pyrrhus. And so in the 280s uh, and 270s, it's actually natural that Rome and Carthage would cooperate to keep those adversaries from landing. And so this is the political position and the relationship that Carthage has with Rome as we are leading up to the beginning of the conflict that Rome and Carthage will have starting in the 260s. So if this is their political position, what can we actually say about how Carthaginian society worked? Well, it's important to begin by saying that Carthaginian society, like Rome, is a form of republic. It's a representative democracy. 
Um, and it's a particularly hierarchical representative democracy where, of course, more prominent people enjoy more prominence and power in that structure. Uh, but basically, civilian power and military power are separated from each other in Carthaginian society, and each office was to some degree uh, elected and also to some degree uh, controlled through consultation with a citizen assembly. Now, um, the functioning of Carthaginian Republican government is somewhat mysterious to us. It is far, far, far less well documented than what we know about Rome. But our sources about Carthage also speak about some other aspects of Carthaginian society that are uh, kind of alarming. Um, one of the things that Carthaginians are particularly reviled for in the Greek and Roman mind is the idea that they practiced ritual child sacrifice. And so this is a story that's, a, that's recorded by a historian named Diodorus Siculus. His last name Siculus means he's from Sicily. And so what we have here is a Greek from Sicily. Um, and that's important to keep in mind when we read what he says. He says the Carthaginians were filled with superstitious dread. And this is at a moment of crisis. Uh, and they believed that they'd neglected the honors of the gods that had been established by their fathers, and in their zeal to make amends for their omission, they selected 200 of the noblest children and sacrificed them publicly, and others who were under suspicion sacrificed themselves voluntarily, in a number not less than 300. And so what we have here is a, a Sicilian Greek talking about the Carthaginians killing and sacrificing 500 fellow citizens in a time of uh, particular concern that the gods were upset. Now, um, Diodorus Siculus, as a Sicilian Greek, of course, is a naturally biased, uh, naturally biased source when talking about Carthage, because Sicilian Greeks and Carthaginians fought a lot. There was a tremendous amount of mutual suspicion. Uh, and so when a, a Sicilian Greek talks about this, it's interesting to know that it was said, but we also have to be um, pretty, uh, pretty concerned about the reliability of this. This is a text written by an adversary. Uh, but despite our, our skepticism and the extreme bias of Diodorus Siculus' account, it seems that there is some ritual burial of the remains of children in Carthaginian spaces. Um, and so on the right, is a, a tombstone from an area that has been called a Tophet. Now the Tophet is actually a name um, for a site alongside the old port of Carthage where there are markers like this um, and the physical remains of a large number of children. And the name Tophet actually comes from a, a biblical reference. It's not actually a Carthaginian title at all. But once we pick at this a little bit more and we look at the evidence that we have, it's clear that most of the remains on this site are actually those of young goats and young lambs. Um, and it's also far from clear if the human remains that are on this site are the remains of children who died naturally, um, maybe children who died soon after birth, and this is a commemoration or a thank, a thank offering even to the gods for giving that small period of life to that child. Um, it is not clear at all that there's actually child sacrifice going on. It's possible, um, but there's absolutely no scholarly consensus about this. And the only reason we would even imagine that that's what's going on is when we have literary evidence written by hostile sources like Diodorus uh, that, that talks about spaces that are places where we have archaeologically found human remains. But I think we should be pretty skeptical of the idea that there's widespread child sacrifice in Carthage. Um, there, we probably even could be skeptical of the fact that there's any child sacrifice at all in Carthage. Um, but it is also clear that the condition and the respect that Carthaginians have for human rights is not a very modern way of thinking about human rights. Uh, there's a, a, a joke that was told by a Roman historian that um, worked at Yale in the 1950s, and he, he said that the worst dissertation topic for graduate students to embark upon is a study of human rights in Carthage, because the dissertation would basically consist of three words. There aren't any. Um, that's a little bit extreme. In fact, that's a lot extreme. But the story of human sacrifice in Carthage that our sources reveal, though dubious, does uh, correspond to some degree to a lack of 
respect for human rights that we see in other aspects of Carthaginian society, and in particular in the way that Carthaginians treated their soldiers. So the Carthaginian army is a professional army with a long-term service requirement, but the, the, the soldiers are usually citizens made up of, um, you know, citizens of tribute paying states or other peoples that have been co-opted and brought into the service of the Carthaginian state by Carthaginian military dominance of the regions around them. There are citizen soldiers, but the vast majority of the soldiers in the army are either mercenaries or people who are serving, um, you know, to a degree perhaps unwillingly. And the problem with that kind of military arrangement is those troops are very, very good when they choose to fight, but you cannot always count on their loyalty. And so Carthage dealt with disloyal soldiers in a particularly brutal fashion. It crucified them. Uh, and this was supposed to be an example that encouraged Carthaginians to, or Carthaginian soldiers or soldiers in the Carthaginian army to fight hard because they would be punished if they didn't. Um, but it also had a perverse incentive where if soldiers feared that this might happen to them, they were less willing actually to remain loyal to Carthage. And we'll see in the aftermath of the First Punic War exactly how that becomes a problem. But at the turn of the third century, Carthage is seen almost certainly as the most powerful state in the Western Mediterranean, and certainly as the state that is most powerfully able to project power beyond its home region. So if you look at a map of Roman territory and Carthaginian territory in the period after Rome's defeat of Pyrrhus, what you see is Rome has a very well integrated Italian territory, um, but it is connected by land. It is not connected. Um, it doesn't have much overseas territory. In fact, it doesn't really even have the ability to project power overseas because it lacks a navy. Versus Carthage has a massive amount of territory, um, far larger than what Rome has in Italy, uh, but it also is able to move troops around, uh, move armies around, and place them at various places across the Western Mediterranean. And so when we're talking about the uh, state best able to project power in that moment, it is certainly Carthage. It had the greatest navy in the region, control of most of the trade, and access to far more raw materials than Rome did. Um, but in some ways, Carthage's influence and its proximity to Italy made it almost inevitable that Roman power, as Rome came to dominate Italy, um, would come into conflict with Carthaginian entrenched interests, especially given Rome's chronic need to expand uh, and the way that the Roman Commonwealth counted on military victories to keep everybody excited about being part of Rome's political structure. And ultimately, Roman Carthage will fight three wars. They're aptly named the First, Second, and Third Punic Wars, Punic comes from the Latin name for Phoenician, um, and so it refers to basically the Roman understanding, the Roman description of what Carthage was. Um, these wars, and especially the First and Second Punic Wars, become defining moments for the Roman Republic because they represent moments when Romans display the resiliency their society has developed, as well as an ability to respond creatively to crises. And these things are characteristic Roman values. Uh, and seeing them expressed was a profound shock to the Carthaginians who had never fought an adversary like Rome. Uh, and the Great Wars, even though they had tremendous costs for the Romans, actually did not check the expansionist tendencies in Roman society. Instead, they actually created conditions that supercharged those expansionist tendencies. Um, but if you remember, Rome took conquest, Rome took control in Italy by exploiting any opportunity for conquest or for aggressive actions that presented itself. And the case of Tarentum is a perfect example of this. Uh, Rome had made a treaty with Tarentum that respected the territorial integrity of the Tarentines, and then once it felt secure enough to violate the treaty, it did. Um, and then Rome prepared to fight Tarentum, and eventually, uh, after Pyrrhus's engagement, and then Pyrrhus's withdrawal, and then Pyrrhus's re-engagement, um, Rome was able to win its fight with Tarentum in 272, and it conquered the city and absorbed Tarentum into the Roman Commonwealth. And part of what made this possible was an army uh, that grew out of this Roman Commonwealth where people were excited to fight alongside Rome because they assumed they would win. Um, and they assumed that when they won, they would get lots of rewards, plunder and other things that would make them want to keep fighting.
And so once Rome started fighting in this way, it was very hard for Rome to stop. The momentum of conquest, um, once started, was very difficult to slow down. And the First Punic War develops in uh, some of the same ways that the war with Tarentum develops. Uh, Rome basically saw an opportunity to expand its sphere of influence, and it took the chance to do this. Now, Sicily is the uh, place where this began, and Sicily is the site of most of the fighting. And so the, the war begins when a group of mercenaries called the Mamertini take over the city of Masana in northeastern Sicily. You can see Masana on the map. <clears throat> Basically, the Mamertini, who may have been somehow connected by kinship to, um, to Roman citizens, uh, they start using Masana as basically a base to start raiding uh, other parts of the island. And in response, this brings them into conflict with Hero, the ruling tyrant of the city of Syracuse, which is a Greek, an old Greek colony that is the dominant power in, Western, or in uh, eastern Sicily. Uh, and so Syracuse responds to the Mamertini by mobilizing. And the Mamertini then appeal to both Rome and Carthage. What the Mamertini are hoping is that um, you know, Syracuse is more powerful than the Mamertini, but Carthage is a good match for Syracuse, and so is Rome. And the appeal to Carthage is immediately one that the Carthaginians answer. And they send a force to Masana, um, and they start trying to defend Masana against Syracuse, but then the Romans answer as well. And uh, when Rome arrives, the Mamertini effectively say to Carthage, okay, well, we're actually going to align with the Romans, so you guys can all go home. Uh, and this provokes a conflict <clears throat> that probably no one expected. And it's a conflict that, <clears throat> that Roman Carthage could have diffused without falling into war if they really wanted to. But ultimately what happens is the Romans make an alliance with the Mamertini. The uh, Romans then ask the Carthaginians to withdraw. This inadvertently, or actually this probably advertently, uh, leads to conflict between the Romans and the Carthaginians. They fight a battle outside of Masana, the Carthaginians retreat. Uh, and then as the war develops and Roman forces land in Sicily and start fighting, the um, ability for Rome and Carthage to step back from the brink disappears. Uh, and as the Romans fight in Sicily, it becomes clear to Syracuse that they want no part of fighting the Romans. They switch sides, break their alliance with the Carthaginians, make peace with the Romans, and uh, then Rome and Carthage fall into actual conflict. Um, and so hostilities began in 264, but by the end of the 260s, this conflict has spread. And you can see all of the different places where Rome and Carthage are fighting. Um, you see basically the conflict uh, with all of these battles between 264 and 241. Uh, this is a long-standing conflict that lasts for an entire generation. And as the conflict develops, Rome becomes very much aware of its limitations in fighting a naval war against the premier naval power in the Western Mediterranean. So when we think about naval battles, um, and we think about naval battles in an ancient context, we have to understand it is very difficult to develop the capacity to fight an effective naval battle without ships and without really significant training. Uh, because the ships that we are talking about in antiquity involve large, large vessels with lots of different banks of rowers that have to maneuver um, in such a way that they basically line up and if you look at the slide on the far left you see there's a bronze prow it's a ram uh, and you line the ship up in such a way that that prow that um, spike on the prow punctures the hull of the other ship and so it's incredibly difficult to get a bank or to get five banks of rowers in a quinquireme to row together to think strategically in such a way that they can line the ship up, they can counteract the defensive maneuvers of an opposing fleet, and they can puncture the, the hull of the ship effectively. This is even harder when, if you're the Romans, you don't have any of these ships. Romans didn't have any warships that could compete with what Carthage had. Um, and so when Romans saw that the war was dragging on, they undertook for the first time to build warships. 
Uh, and they built 100 quinquiremes and 20 triremes. So a quinquireem has five banks of ores, and you can see how this looks in practice. A trireme has three banks of ores. Uh, in each of these banks of ores, you have rowers who have to work together. Um, if you think of a crew skull, this is like a crew skull times 100. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of rowers on this. Um, but as we see the... Uh, as we see Polybius talk about this, and Polybius is a, a Greek historian who is a top-notch historian of the Roman wars with Carthage. Uh, what Polybius says is the shipwrights were absolutely inexperienced in building quinquiremes. They had no idea how to do this because these ships had never been used in Italy. And the matter caused them much difficulty. Uh, and this fact shows us better than anything how spirited and daring Roman policy was. Because uh, when they first undertook to send their ships to Masana, and you see here, uh, the Straits of Masana, the challenge that Rome had, um, is not so major in moving forces from the tip of Italy across the Straits of Masana. Rome had no warships. They didn't have a single boat. And so they borrowed boats from the Tarentines, who they'd conquered, uh, you know, 10 years before, eight years before. The Carthaginians then put to sea to attack them as they were crossing. Uh, and as the Carthaginians did this, one of their ships, a quinquireme, advanced too far in its eagerness to overtake the Romans, and it ran aground, and it fell into the hands of the Romans. And the Romans then used this ship as a model and built their fleet on its pattern. <clears throat> so this is an interesting detail that we have to understand here. Ancient warships, like a quinquireme, um, were so light and so buoyant that if the crew was not there working the quinquireme uh, and sailing the quinquireme, um, the ship would float by itself. And so when the Carthaginian ship ran aground, basically the crew just bailed out, they swam to another ship, the ship was just there. And so what the Romans did is they took this ship that ran aground and they reverse engineered it. Uh, and they reverse engineered it so that the Carthaginian ship was the pattern that they used to build their entire fleet. And you can, of course, imagine some, some problems with this, right? Uh, if you don't know how to build this ship and you reverse engineer the entire thing, you're gonna make some mistakes. But even more importantly, if you built it correctly, uh, and there aren't any problems with this, still you have to have sailors who know how to do this. Um, they have to know how to sail this ship. And what happened was the Romans actually built these ships. They built 100 quinquiremes, based on the reverse engineering of the uh, Carthaginian ship that ran aground, but they really didn't have sailors who were confident in their ability to fight a naval battle. And because an ancient naval battle is won by maneuvering, if your soldiers and your sailors don't know how to do that maneuvering, they aren't going to win. Um, and if you look at the way that the banks of oars in a quinquireum function, and you can see here on the slide on the right, um, you can see that these people are pretty much trapped. Uh, you know, they are inside the ship. If the ship's hull is punctured, the ship itself will float um, as long as there are no people on there. But if there are all these people on there weighing it down, then the ship will sink. And if you are one of the people on the lower banks of oars uh, and you've never been in a naval battle, this is going to freak you out. And so in the first engagement that a small, that a detachment of Roman quinquiremes have against the Carthaginians, the sailors, uh, the, the rowers, everybody on the ship, they see the Carthaginians approaching and they freak out and they bail. Uh, and the Carthaginians then get all of those ships, all I think 15 or 20 that the Romans had deployed, they get them intact and the Carthaginians just get them. You know, they're freshly ready to sail. Uh, and the Roman commanders realize very quickly, this is a big problem. Um, our people are not confident enough, even if we have the ships, our people are not confident enough to fight the Carthaginians by sea in conventional ways. Uh, and so the Romans then um, come up with a really inventive solution. They decide effectively that their sailors, their rowers, their um, people cannot and will not win a battle against the Carthaginians at this phase in the conflict, uh, unless Rome does something very different. And so with the Rome what the Romans decide to do is uh, to not fight a naval battle the way that these were traditionally fought, to not fight by maneuvering and trying to ram uh, and trying to, you know, um, 
use skill and tactics to defeat the Carthaginians because they don't possess those skills and they haven't mastered those tactics. So instead what they do is they uh, put a gangplank with a spike on their ships. This is something that's called the corvus for the Latin word for crow. And this is basically a hook and a ramp. <clears throat> but what the, what the Romans do uh, to use this in battle is they, they sail up next to the Carthaginian ships and then they drop this giant spike onto the deck of the Carthaginian ships. And then they send marines across the gangplank to attack the Carthaginians as if it were a land battle. And this gives the Romans the confidence to fight effectively. Uh, this, you know, creating a land battle on the sea allows the Romans to believe that they can be victorious. And in the first battle where the Romans use the Corvus, the Carthaginians have no idea how to counteract this. Uh, and it freaks them out to see... Romans fighting in such an unconventional way. Uh, and so to, to those who fought in ancient naval battles, the use of the corvus is kind of insane. It's not something that anyone had ever tried before, but it's something the Romans do because they are creative, because this is a moment of um, distress for them. They need to be able to fight militarily somehow using navies, uh, and this is the best that they could do um, on sort of short notice. Over time, of course, the Carthaginians develop countermeasures, but the Romans also develop the capacity to fight in a more conventional way. And the confidence that their sailors get uh, allows them to effectively confront the Carthaginians in later phases in the conflict. But it's not just Roman inventiveness that leads to Rome's success in the First Punic War. It's also, again, this Roman willingness to absorb casualties. And so Rome takes huge casualties in the First Punic War. The First Punic War begins in 264 BC. It ends in 241 BC. These are two census figures from just the middle of the war. In 251 BC, the Roman census counts 297,797 citizens. In 246, and again, this is just the middle of the war. The war isn't over yet. Um, Rome counts 241,712 citizens. Uh, this is, to put in perspective, um, if you multiply these numbers by 1,000, you have kind of the U.S. population around the year 2000. Uh, you know, there are about 300 million people in the United States at that time. Imagine the United States in the middle of a conflict losing 60 million people um, and continuing to fight. This is proportionally what the Romans are absorbing. You know, they are losing fully, in this context, almost 20% of their citizen population. And they keep going. They keep fighting. Um, when the war finally ends in 241, when a Roman fleet is able to uh, defeat a Carthaginian fleet and enforce a peace treaty on Carthage, Rome has absorbed massive, massive casualties. Uh, and it also has been willing to accept massive, massive costs on its society, even to the point where um, Rome in 248 built an entire fleet of 100 ships largely by using, by pawning the jewelry of rich people. Um, this is something where it's not just the state that's fighting the war, it's all citizens, women, children, everyone is absorbing costs for this war. But the treaty that the Romans get the Carthaginians to sign is a, a treaty that has significant consequences for the Carthaginians. Carthaginians are forced to abandon their territories in Sicily um, and give this territory over to the Romans. They're forced to pay a yearly and indemnity to the Romans. They're supposed to surrender all islands between Sicily and Italy to Rome. They're not allowed to sail in Italian waters. And the outcome of this is something that you would expect. Uh, because following this, Carthaginian mercenaries and Carthaginian uh, soldiers revolt upon their return to Carthage. Part of that is they fear what's going to be done to them, the sort of punishment that they might absorb. But part of that too is a sense that Carthage is weak uh, and now these subject populations that have been providing troops for the army um, have the capacity to throw off Carthaginian, uh, Carthaginian domination. While this is happening, um, while Carthage is in the final stages of putting down the revolt in North Africa, the island of Sardinia also rebels. And the mercenaries on the island of Sardinia immediately appeal to Rome for support. Uh, they declare their, their willingness to, sub, to um, become subjects of Rome, and the Roman Senate, despite all, well, all morality, um, it accepts this. It instead, uh, instead of telling these people to 
kind of deal with Carthage and not worry about Rome, the Roman Senate says, we will support you. And when the Carthaginians object to Roman support for the rebellious people on the island of Sardinia, uh, the Romans make the Carthaginian preparation for putting down this revolt in Carthaginian territory a pretext for redeclaring war on Carthage, alleging that the preparations Carthage was making were not against Sardinia, but against Rome itself. And so the Carthaginians, who were barely able to escape destruction in the last war, were in every respect ill-prepared at this moment to resume hostilities with Rome. And so they yielded to circumstance. And they not only gave up Sardinia, but they agreed to pay a further indemnity to the Romans to avoid going to war. And then uh, Rome took Corsica as well, the island of Corsica as well. Now, even someone who is as apologetic about Roman behavior as Polybius says, you know, for this war in which the Romans took Sardinia, it's impossible to discover any reasonable pretext or cause. In this case, everyone would agree that the Carthaginians, contrary to all justice, and merely because the occasion permitted it, were forced to evacuate Sardinia and pay the additional sum. So what Plebeus is basically saying here is that Rome took Sardinia, not for any good reason, just because they could. Uh, and this Roman willingness to do injustice to Carthage, the taking of Sardinia is, by everybody's uh, estimation, contrary to all justice. It's just an opportunistic expansion of Roman territory. This makes Carthage recognize that it has to do something to make up for what it has lost in the First Punic War. And so to do this, Carthage begins a large-scale conquest of Spain. Um, Carthage had a presence in southern Spain for a long time, but the loss of Sicily and the loss of Sardinia and Corsica uh, encouraged Carthage to actually expand the pre the, their presence in Spain um, to make up for the loss of territory in the central Mediterranean. And the uh, conquest is something that's undertaken by a man named Ham Hamilcar Barca. Hamilcar had been the Carthaginian general who put down the revolt of the mercenaries uh, in Carthage after the peace they signed with Rome. And so Hamilcar then is sent out to try to build a Carthaginian um, land empire in Spain. His forces had a modern navy and an army that was quite experienced. Uh, and as, Car as Hamilcar's army became even more experienced fighting Spanish natives, what you began to see is that this was a professional army, the quality of which was really unmatched in the Western Mediterranean. Uh, and so Spain then becomes an alternative power base for the Carthaginians. And Rome isn't paying a tremendous amount of attention to this, but two Roman um, emissaries are sent to Spain to kind of, or two Roman embassies are sent to Spain to try to investigate what's going on. And in 226, um, Rome is concerned enough about the expansion of Carthaginian power in Spain that they negotiate a treaty with Carthage that restricts Carthaginian control of the peninsula to an area south of the Ebro River. And you can see the Ebro River on the map in the sort of upper left of the map. Now, this, uh, this territory is about 80% of, of Spain that Carthage is able to control should it take control of it. What Rome does not expect is that Carthage will actually expand so quickly to the Ebro River. Um, but Rome also built into this treaty a kind of poison pill because Rome separately made an alliance with the city of Saguntum. Now, it's not clear when that alliance with Saguntum happens. It might have happened at the same time the treaty was arranged. It might have happened even sometime after the treaty was arranged. But what we see is that Rome very clearly understands that Saguntum is south of the Ebro River. It very clearly understands that um, it will be able to provide grounds for uh, attack against Carthage should Rome wish to pursue that in, you know, in Spain, should Carthage um, cause enough concern that Rome decides to do something about it. But this Treaty of the Ebro River and Rome's agreement with Saguntum brings us to the verge of the Second Punic War, and in particular, the war with Hannibal. Hannibal is the son of Hamilcar, and Hamilcar dies in battle. Hamilcar's son-in-law briefly takes over for him, and when Hamilcar's son-in-law dies, Hannibal takes control of, Sp of Carthaginian forces in Spain. Um, and by 221 BC, when, Hamilcar is, or when Hannibal is 26 years old, he's brought all of Spain south of the Ebro under Carthaginian control, with the exception of Saguntum. 
And this city, although it's not directly mentioned in the Ebro River Agreement, um, Hannibal understands that an attack on Saguntum would be an attack on Rome. And so in 219 BC, after two years of preparation, Hannibal attacks Saguntum, and Rome then begins a process of negotiating. And this is quite interesting. Um, this is, if we think back to the, the words that Cicero wrote about how Rome is supposed to respond to conflict, um, we saw that Rome believes that conflict should be, wars should be averted by negotiation if possible. And in some cases, Rome takes this seriously and actually engages in legitimate negotiation. In other cases, the negotiation is absurd because Rome wants to fight. But it's clear in the aftermath of Hannibal's move against Saguntum, Rome does not particularly want to fight. They send emissaries um, first to Hannibal, then they send emissaries to the city of Carthage. Uh, in Carthage, they actually ask the Carthaginian establishment, will you just disavow what Hannibal did? Um, and if you guys are not on board with this, you know, tell Hannibal to withdraw from attacking Saguntum and all will be good. What Rome doesn't understand is that Hannibal is actually preparing for a war with Rome. And while the Romans are engaging in these negotiations, uh, Hannibal is mobilizing to actually invade Italy. And so the negotiations proceed while the Romans are taking their time to mobilize consular armies to confront Carthage. Uh, and what no one expects is that Hannibal is actually going to go and attack Italy. What Rome expects is that these consular armies will be organized um, within a year, uh, the Roman army mobilized under one consul will be able to proceed out of Italy, will move into Spain and start rolling back Carthaginian gains in Spain. Another army will be sent to North Africa to knock out Carthage, and that will be how the war will be fought. They are shocked when they realize that Hannibal has, in fact, set out from Spain following his capture of Saguntum, and with war elephants and troops, he's managed to traverse not only Spain and southern Gaul, but actually traverse the Alps uh, and come into northern Italy. And this prevents the Roman invasion of Africa. Um, it also prevents the immediate Roman ability to engage in Spain, because Rome seeing a Carthaginian em enemy coming out of the Alps and entering into Italy um, offers battle. Uh, and the first battle in 218 is a battle fought in a relatively prudent way by one of the consuls. Uh, this is a battle that's fought at Trebia. And Rome loses, but it doesn't lose overwhelmingly. It's a defeat, but it's a defeat that still allows the consul to maintain some of his army, and it allows the consul to eventually, um, you know, continue to... Uh, continue to regroup and fight Hannibal later. But in 217 BC, the uh, Roman forces are defeated again, and this defeat is much different. Uh, the consul elected for, one of the consuls elected for 217 BC is a, a man named um, Gaius Flaminius. And Flaminius is a particularly challenging figure uh, because he is a, a rabble rouser in a sense. Um, he is a man who's elected consul for the first time. Um, as He's the first person in his family to be elected as consul. He's what's called a novus homo, or a new man. Um, and Flaminius is an incredibly inspiring figure, but he's also a figure that alarms senatorial traditionalists. So as consul in 223 BC, he wins a victory over the Gauls that he, in a war that he fought because simply um, he, had been he had been summoned to return to Rome uh, to answer questions about electoral irregularities. He simply refused to open the letter and instead fought the Gauls and then returned to Rome victorious so that uh, he could stand against the Senate uh, and advocate for his own position from a position of strength. In 217, when Flaminius is again elected consul, he again fears that the Senate might pull the rug out from under him before he's able to inflict this major defeat that he is sure he can inflict on Hannibal. And so Flaminius is tricked by Hannibal into fighting along the lake shore of Lake Trasimena. Uh, and the story that we, that we have of this is really um, a testament to the great genius that Hannibal had. Because Hannibal understood that the way that he could crack this Roman commonwealth, the way that he could crack this Roman alliance structure was to induce Rome to fight major battles and beat them in those battles. He knew that Roman allies were not just going to simply desert Rome because the war was dragging on. 
<clears throat> they didn't do this in the First Punic War. And uh, the victory in the First Punic War would, if anything, have convinced them of the necessity and the advantage of continuing to fight with Rome. And so what Hannibal tried to do was find battle locations and conditions that would allow him to annihilate Roman armies. And he figured that if he could induce Romans to fight enough times uh, and he could annihilate enough armies, this would break the Roman alliance structure. People would say, you know what, we are not winning battles with Rome. We're being induced into making all kinds of mistakes and large numbers of our citizens are dying because the Romans are incompetent. And Lake Trasimeno is the first moment where Hannibal has this kind of breakthrough. And it's because Flaminius feared that he would be summoned back to Rome before he could conclude the war. So what Hannibal does is he positions troops alongside a narrow, flat area in the lakeshore. Um, and he then positions a large number of his troops in the hills above this flat area along the shore. He induces uh, Flaminius's troops to come along the lakeshore into this place where the shore is, expands out and there's a relatively flat area. Hannibal then uses two detachments of troops to cut off the Roman retreat. And in the fog alongside the lake, the Roman soldiers get confused, uh, and then Hannibal sends his troops down from the hills. And so the Roman soldiers basically are pinned. Um, behind them is the lake, so they can't retreat. Along the lake shore are these two detachments of Hannibal's troops that have outflanked the Roman forces, and the Roman forces can't push through either of those very effectively. And then there is a large group of Hannibalic Hannibalic uh, troops coming down from the hills who, uh, you of course, occupy high ground and they press down on the Roman forces and kind of crush them against the lake itself. It is an overwhelming victory by Hannibal and his, his troops. Um, and it's so alarming to the Romans that um, they, in 216, mobilized the biggest army the Romans have ever put together in the history of the Republic to that point. Um, in 216 BC, they again offer battle against Hannibal. Um, and you can see here the way the battle is laid out. But again, what Hannibal has done is he has chosen the location. Um, and he has induced this large Roman force to confront him directly. Uh, and in the battle, Hannibal, we're told by Livy, kills 45,000 infantry and 2,700 cavalry. And this is equally divided between Roman citizens and allies, but it's not just that soldiers die, it's leaders too. The consuls, um, some of the consuls' quaestors are killed, so the people who run the accounts for the consular campaign, they die. 29 military tribunes, a number of ex-consuls, and 80 distinguished men who are either members of the Senate or held offices that qualified them for membership. So this is a battle that not only guts the Roman infantry, it also guts the Roman leadership structure. And after Cani, Hannibal gets what he expected. Allies start defecting from Rome. Um, because allies begin thinking that maybe it's, they can make a better deal, they can have a better deal working with Hannibal uh, than they would have working with the Romans. And the most notable city to do this is actually the city of Capua, the second largest city in Italy at this moment. And Capua's defection particularly shocks Romans um, because Capua is not an allied city. It's a city populated by Roman citizens. And so this is a, a clear sign that the Roman Commonwealth is starting to break because these Roman citizens now have switched sides and joined Hannibal. Now, the Roman response is directed by this man. Um, Fabius Maximus Conctator. And uh, what Fabius represents is a, a, a step for continuity, a step for calm. Um, what Fabius realizes is even with the defections of Roman allies, even with the defections of Roman citizens in places like Capua, Rome still has a number of tremendous advantages over Hannibal. Uh, and what Fabius decides to do is uh, to basically create a strategy where he is not going to give Hannibal the battles, the big set piece battles where Hannibal can annihilate large numbers of Romans uh, that Hannibal requires. Instead, what Fabius decides to do um, is shadow Hannibal's troops, to not give them 
the battle that they crave. Instead, to use a large Roman army that he keeps together on ground that he chooses uh, and use that army to pick off stragglers from Hannibal's troops, um, to pick off, you know, foraging parties. And if Hannibal has a city that has defected to it and the city is not well defended, Fabius will use Roman troops to peel those forces or to take that city back. Uh, what Livy says about, about Fabius is that the Fabian tactics, which actually begin um, in the aftermath of Trezimeno, but become a centerpiece of Roman strategy after the defeat at Cannae, uh, these tactics break the terrible continuity of Roman defeats. They give Hannibal cause for alarm because he can see that the Romans had chose a war leader who, instead of trusting fortune, was capable of a rational plan. And in this, Livy is actually understating the significance of what Fabius is doing. Because Fabius not only understands the strategic advantages the Romans have, um, in that Hannibal cannot maintain control of all of the scattered places that have defected to him, he doesn't have enough resources to do this, uh, but also what Fabius understands is the psychological aspect of this. Hannibal is counting on quick and decisive victories to break people from Roman control. And if he doesn't get those victories, Rome then has time to roll back the people who have, and roll back the cities and the people who have defected to Hannibal. Uh, and gradually over time, what Fabius is able to do is, and Fabius and other le others like him are able to do, is undo a lot of the damage that the defections after Cani had caused. And this is a strategy that Rome pursues for a very long time. Um, it's a strategy pursued in Italy for more than a decade. Uh, and it's pursued by a leadership structure led by people like Fabius, but also other uh, older commanders who are much more conservative in how they're going to approach Hannibal than people like Flaminius. Um, but in the meantime, while these older generals are fighting in Italy, other Roman forces expand the conflict. So Roman forces sent to attack Carthaginian um, Carthaginian. Uh, structures, Carthaginian uh, domination in Spain. Italian allies are mostly reconquered. And when these Italian allies are reconquered, there are devastating consequences. Like in the city of Capua, large parts of Capuan territories is confiscated and taken over as Roman public land. Um, as this is happening in Italy, though, the people leading the campaign in Spain uh, become younger. Um, and the most prominent of these is this man, Scipio Africanus. Now, Scipio represents a new generation that takes power in the, in the context of the war with Hannibal. And what Scipio is able to do is understand a uh, kind of new level of military preparedness and military tactical sophistication. Hannibal's genius is in understanding what grounds will work best for the type of battle that Hannibal wants to fight, choosing those locations, inducing his enemies to fight in those locations, and expertly positioning his troops so that they can take advantage of those locations. What Scipio is able to do is reposition his troops in the context of a battle. And so Hannibal is incredible at establishing the groundwork for a battle and establishing the conditions that Hannibal wants. What Scipio is able to do, though, is take his army and respond dynamically to a battle while it's unfolding. He is, in a sense, the perfect match for Hannibal. And Scipio is, uh, hones his techniques in the battles in Spain. Um, but ultimately, Scipio is able to lead the attack in Spain that wrests the, the peninsula from Carthaginian possession. Uh, and then he's entrusted with, he's elected consul, and he's entrusted by the Senate with landing a force in Africa to confront Carthage on its own home territory. And when Scipio's force lands in North Africa, Hannibal is finally summoned home. Now, it's worth acknowledging that people like Fabius Maximus strongly, vehemently opposed what Scipio was doing. They didn't feel his army was up to it. They felt that uh, going and attacking North Africa when Hannibal was still in Italy was a very serious strategic mistake, uh, and that Hannibal needed to be defeated before anything was done in North Africa. Ultimately, though, Scipio is proven right. Because Scipio's forces land in North Africa, um, they then compel the Carthaginians to order Hannibal out of Italy. 
And so Hannibal's departure from Italy is caused not by Roman victories in Italy, but by Carthaginian struggles to counteract the Romans in Africa. And on October 19th of 202 BC, Carthage and Hannibal confronts Scipio on a battlefield of Hannibal's choosing uh, at the Battle of Zama. And Scipio's dynamic ability to adjust the uh, techniques and, and adjust the positioning of his troops allows him to defeat Hannibal in a pitched battle. Um, and this is significant. Uh, the victory at the Battle of Zama forces Carthage to sign a particularly harsh treaty. Uh, the treaty, in fact, is so devastating that Carthage loses its fleet. It's forced to pay massive amounts of gold over a 50-year span to Rome. It's also forced to request from Rome the ability to even muster an army to defend itself if someone attacks us. Uh, and this was a decisive defeat, and it's one that placed Rome without question as a top power in the Western Mediterranean. Uh, by the end of the Second Punic War, Rome controlled Italy, Sicily, Spain, and it had basically neutralized Carthage as well. Uh, and so what we see here is the great battle, in a sense, for Rome. Um, the Second Punic War was an incredibly difficult struggle for the Romans. We see that the Romans endure food shortages. We see that the Romans have to mobilize more citizens um, than any ancient state had ever mobilized before, certainly an ancient state of the, the size of Rome. Uh, it's estimated that at one point, Rome has mobilized 70% of all of the fighting age men in the, entire, uh, in the entirety of Italy uh, under Roman control. And those forces are sent around the world. They fight in Spain, they fight in North Africa, they fight in Greece. Um, this is very much a, a world war in an ancient context. And all of the things that we hear about when we think about total war in the 1940s, Rome is doing this. Civilian life is dramatically disrupted because of the Second Punic War. And yet Rome chooses to continue to fight. And it ultimately wins this conflict despite all of these really significant costs that it was forced to endure throughout it. Uh, this becomes a defining moment for the Romans. Uh, but it is also a moment that really drags Rome into the responsibility for managing the entire affairs of the Mediterranean. And so next time when we look at the aftermath of the Second Punic War, what we'll see is uh, when a republic is drawn into a world conflict, it is very, very difficult for that republic to extricate itself later. And Rome certainly faces that particular challenge and doesn't have a great solution to it.